Tonka Gulf incident, which took place over a series of days, occurred over half a century ago. There was and continues to be much controversy over what happened on the night of August 4, 1964. This video will tell the story of that night as it happened, as it appeared to those involved. A later video will explain what we know after the passage of time and the declassification of much information. The August 2nd confrontation between North Vietnamese patrol boats and the USS Maddox and F-8 Crusader aircraft was over. The event had taken place during the day, some of it even being photographed, and had ended up with the PT boats limping away, one possibly sinking, and the Maddox withdrawing from the area. President Johnson had decided the U.S. would issue a warning, but nothing further. It was determined that, in order to show resolve, the Maddox would continue with his DeSoto patrols the next day, but this time, accompanied by another destroyer, the USS Turner Joy. Heiko would continue supporting Yankee team operations over Laos and would have the added requirement to provide support for DeSoto patrols. Constellation crew, enjoying liberty in Hong Kong, got word to start quietly preparing for an early departure, after which the ship would make a hurried transit back to Yankee Station. On August 3rd, the Maddox, along with the Turner Joy, completed an uneventful DeSoto patrol along the North Vietnam coast, and this time, Tyco aircraft were nearby in case needed. That evening, as Connie's sailors continued enjoying liberty, word reached them that the ship would get underway earlier than expected. Liberty would expire at midnight. The following morning, Tuesday, August 4th, Connie got underway from Hong Kong, she headed for Yankee Station, a 400-mile transit. Through the day, the crew worked on getting their minds off Liberty and back into the operational mindset, getting ready for whatever might be in their future. As planned, the rising morning sun on August 4th saw the Maddox and Turner Joy returning to their patrol track in international waters off the North Vietnam coast. Early that morning, the destroyer group sent a message saying intelligence indicated the North Vietnamese viewed the U.S. destroyers as part of the ongoing O-Plan 34 Alpha coastal strikes, which they weren't, and that air cover was required immediately overhead the destroyers. By late afternoon, the ships had completed the patrol and turned away from the North Vietnam coast. About that time, the Maddox received new intercepts indicating North Vietnamese patrol boats were making preparations for a military operation, interpreted to mean an attack on the U.S. destroyers. By 2100, the destroyers were heading southeast at best speed, away from North Vietnam. As evening came to the Gulf of Tonkin, weather got nasty. From Tycho's flight deck, lightning flashes could be seen to the northwest, the area of Turner Joy and Maddox. Tracking the flight schedule, Stockdale noticed the two junior pilots were standing the Crusader alert. He was not happy. He always wanted at least one experienced pilot on alert. Not long afterwards, he heard A-1 Sky Raider engines starting on the flight deck. It was Commander George Edmondson and Lieutenant Jer Barton, also on alert, preparing to launch from their VA-52 Sky Raiders. Stockdale got word that the DeSoto Patrol had picked up fast closing radar contacts and expected to be attacked again. Throwing on his flight gear, Stockdale ran up to the flight deck, in the darkness, he could feel a ship turning into the wind to start launch of aircraft, and he could see the Crusader on the starboard cat had already started its engine, but the one on the port cat had not. After a brief period of commotion, the junior pilot on the port catapult was told to get out of the cockpit. Stockdale hopped in, and in short order, had the engine started. Stockdale was nearly ready to launch when the first Crusader shot down the catapult, and to everyone's dismay, the lights on the aircraft went out at the end of the cat stroke, indicating the aircraft had lost electrical power, a perilous emergency at night on launch. To everyone's relief, the jet didn't descend into the water, and the pilot was able to engage emergency power. But he would be coming back to the ship, not continuing on mission. 
Stockdale radioed that upon launch, he wouldn't wait for a wingman, he would go alone. Very shortly, he was in the air, taking a vector to the Maddox and Turner Joy. Meanwhile, Connie, far to the northeast, was springing into action. An E-1B tracer surveillance plane, affectionately called the FUD, had been sitting alert on Connie's flight deck for hours, and his crew was about to be relieved by the next crew when word came to launch. The plane commander, 23-year-old Lieutenant J.G. Forrest Zetterberg, got the engine started and they launched into the night, proceeding toward their surveillance station to support the Maddox and the Turner Joy. The FUD, call sign overpass, established comms with the destroyers and the airborne aircraft. Maddox indicated its air search radar was bent, or inoperative, so it would be up to Connie's FUD radar intercept controller, Lieutenant J.G. Aldrum, to provide air control which he did. Back on the Connie, Lieutenant Commander John Nicholson, the operations officer for VA-144, an A-4 Skyhawk squadron, had just finished supper in the Dirty Shirt ward room. Nicholson was getting ready to watch the evening movie, which in that day was literally a film played from a projector. As the movie was about to start, the phone rang, and after a moment, the watchstander called into the audience, I need a VA-144 pilot. Nicholson jumped up, went to the phone, and was told to grab two other pilots, throw on flight gear, and hustle down to the intel center. Nicholson grabbed the two pilots he had been sitting next to, Lieutenant J.G. Ron Bach and Lieutenant J.G. Everett Alvarez. Given the barest information, they left for the flight deck. They wondered if this was a drill. They had been through similar drills before, and before even starting engines, the ship would tell them it was an exercise and they would be done. Up on Connie's flight deck, They found what they expected, complete darkness, heavy rain, and lightning. Getting into a Skyhawk, Nicholson quickly closed the canopy to avoid getting soaked even further. Somewhat surprised when he was directed to start his engine, he thought that this was further than any previous exercise had gone. Then he was directed to the catapult. He knew this was no drill. After the catapult hurled him into the darkness of the night, he climbed above the ship waiting for his wingman to launch and join him in orbit. Upon launch, Alvarez, on his first cruise, radioed he had vertigo, a hazardous condition for any pilot at low altitude at night and in bad weather. Nicholson told him to keep his eyes on the instruments and start a slow climb. Nicholson and Bach joined with Alvarez, and, with Nicholson leading, they had to do a dogleg around the southern tip of Hainan Island before going direct to the destroyers. They would get to the scene of action shortly after Stockdale's and Tycho's other aircraft. As Stockdale climbed to cruise altitude off Tycho, he heard the voice of Commander Wes McDonald, commanding officer of a Tycho Skyhawk squadron. McDonald had launched and was also inbound to the destroyers, about 15 minutes behind Stockdale. Shortly thereafter, Stockdale charged his guns and switched up the destroyer's control frequency. The voice on the circuit said the destroyers had multiple contacts, Stockdale made visual contact with the destroyers and, never exceeding a thousand feet, he searched around the destroyers, always keeping the destroyers or their phosphorescent wakes in sight, but he could find no hostile patrol boats. There were reports of torpedoes in the water, but Stockdale saw nothing. No patrol boats, no hostile searchlights, no torpedo wakes, nothing. Out of ammunition and gas, he climbed and turned to take a course for Tycho. Unlike the engagement two days earlier, this night, he saw nothing on the ocean but the two U.S. destroyers. Nicholson's flight from the Connie checked into the destroyer's control circuit just as the Tycho's aircraft were checking out. Having been given little information, Nicholson asked, Where are we and what are we doing here? Given an estimate of the situation, Nicholson and flight began looking for hostile contacts. Nicholson reported seeing two high-speed contacts heading south. The ship responded that the friendly ships were heading north, so the southbound ones he saw must be hostile, and he was cleared to attack them. Nicholson told Alvarez, who was carrying flares for illumination, to remain at altitude. Bach would join Nicholson in the attack. As they armed and rolled in to engage the southbound contacts, the radio blared, Hold fire! Hold fire! The urgent voice on the radio stated that the friendly ships were actually heading south, The last-minute correction prevented a blue-on-blue disaster, but shook whatever confidence Nicholson initially had in the destroyer's situational awareness. 
He and Bach climbed back up to a higher altitude to search and await direction. After a period of fruitless search, Nicholson's flight ran low on fuel, and they realized they had delayed their departure too long. They jettisoned all their pods and stores and took a route directly over the Chinese island of Hainan, risking a host of bad outcomes, but luckily avoided being engaged by the Chinese or running out of gas, and were able to return to Connie. Upon landing on Tycho, Stockdale went to his ready room. There he was met by an assortment of ship, air wing, and staff officers, all wanting to know what he had seen and what was happening. He told them that, minus the U.S. destroyers, he had seen nothing. He was given a copy of the message traffic the destroyers had been sending during the night's engagement, and, in his opinion, they read like someone who had initially thought they were being attacked, but towards the end of the engagement, the messages indicated the ships were beginning to doubt if anything had been there in the dark. Exhausted, Stockdale made his way to his stateroom and was soon fast asleep. Other pilots reported seeing possible indications of hostile craft, but none reported seeing an actual hostile boat. Through the night and early morning, urgent messages went back and forth between the ships, the SINCPAC commander in Hawaii, and President Johnson's staff from Washington, D.C. As the ships rode out a storm on the South China Sea and the pilots tried to sleep, decisions were being made in Washington that would change the course of history. <laughs>